In the late 1980s, the standard weapon of the U.S. Army was the Springfield Trapdoor, an old-school Civil War rifle. From afar, this weapon could easily be mistaken for a musket from the War of Independence against the background of European achievements. This thing looked shabby. The Army held competitions for new weapons on a regular basis, but the result was the same. Everything changed with the appearance of smokeless powder ammunition, and the production of smokeless powder in the USA was not given at once. By June 1892, Frankfurt Arsenal presented a cartridge of 30 caliber while still on Belgian gunpowder. The Americans got their own gunpowder two years later. In those days, the U.S. Army was small at about 15,000 men. In case of military conflict, the Army was increased many times over by the influx of volunteers. Therefore, specific conditions were imposed on the rifle, mandatory magazine cutoff, making the rifle single shot, and the cutoff switch had to be visible to the commander. It is desirable that the rifle could be easily loaded with both magazine and individual cartridges at any position of the cutoff switch. A separate requirement was that the rifle could be produced at government arsenals. Many officers of that time had seen the Civil War and remembered very well the army armed with a zoo of designs from private companies. The winner was design number 28, the Norwegian Krag Jorgensen rifle. It withstood various tests, could be disassembled without special tools, and thanks to a single firing pin, it had a smooth bolt action. The U.S. military liked the weapon's unique magazine, which was loaded through a right-side hinged lid. The rifle could be quickly loaded with single cartridges and could be reloaded with the bolt closed. According to those ideas about firefighting, it was just what was needed for a volunteer army. After all, commanders had to make sure that soldiers did not shoot too much. It was not adopted, and American soldiers went to war with cartridges instead of pouches. Many interested parties perceived such a decision of the commission as undermining the foundations. Two contestants even sued the U.S. government for the fact that the army had adopted a foreign design. Congress, flooded with complaints, American designer is offended, did not challenge the decision, but decided to organize another competition, where Krag Rifle was to be compared with 14 improved models only from American manufacturers. Otherwise, $400,000 for the production of the new weapon would not be allocated. In May 1893, the results were summarized. All 14 competitors received the same resolution. System is not unsuited to the military service, and the Krag Jorgensen rifle was officially adopted as Springfield M, 1892 in two versions. Infantry rifle with 862 mm barrel length and carbine with 635 mm barrel length. Meanwhile, the Navy, having looked at the Army's mess, decided to adopt their own rifle for their own specific requirements. The Marine Corps, unlike the Army, did not envision explosive growth in case of war, so why not purchase a small batch of advanced weapons for the guise of increased straight-handedness? As with the Army rifle, it started with the ammunition. The ammunition had to have a long range of direct fire, lightweight for a larger ammunition pack. The Marines' ammunition pack eventually totaled 180 rounds versus 100 for regular infantry, which could help a lot when landing in the next Heart of Darkness. Also, the bullet has to penetrate the steam boiler of a then-current destroyer. This is to stop desperate guys deciding to attack the ship at night with pole mines. As a result, the 6 gex 60 was chosen. A barrel with the required rifling was designed for it, and then the competition for the rifle was announced. The competition was led by Luger's rifle, the same creator of the pistol. But the designer refused the third round, and the winner was James Paris Lee's rifle, adopted as the M1895 Lee Navy. The Navy, unlike the Army, did not have its own production capabilities, so the contract for the production of 10,000 units was awarded to the Winchester Company. The rifle gives the impression of being the work of a traitor. Lee also took an original approach to loading the rifle. At the end of the 19th century, most rifles were loaded either by pack or by clip. A clip simply speeds up the loading of the magazine. With a pack load, the cartridges are inserted into the magazine packed in a pack. This is faster than clip loading, but the ammunition weighs more, and without the pack, a multi-shot rifle becomes a single-shot rifle. Lee invented the original wire bundle, 
The direct firing range was 663 meters with an accuracy of 1 MOA at 91 meters. Accelerated to 779 m per s, the bullet penetrated 11 mm boiler iron at a distance of 30 meters. Not surprisingly, the barrel life was 2,000 rounds. Later, in 1897, a new cartridge with copper jacket was adopted, which raised the barrel life to 8,000 rounds. In addition, the powder for 6 mm ammunition was not produced in the USA, but was purchased in Europe, which greatly affected the price per shot. The rifle was also used in some wars. For example, Guantanamo Bay became American thanks to the 1st Marine Battalion armed with the Lee Navy. Smedley Butler, a future denouncer of U.S. aggressive policies, fired this weapon at the Chinese during the Boxer Rebellion. This rifle did not fire at surface targets, but Browning M1895 6 Cure 60 machine guns did. Spanish sailors did not like it. In the hands of highly skilled shooters, the rifle proved to be an excellent weapon, despite its unpleasant property of scattering parts during heavy firing. In addition, according to the results of combat operations in the Philippines, the 6mm bullets had low stopping power against local juramentado, who would ambush them from ambush. The Americans reasoned that a short-barreled pistol would be the best way to deal with such an event, and so the 45 ACP cartridge and the M1911 pistol were introduced. The Marine Corps received the first batch of M1895 SI in 1897, and in December 1898 the Board of Officers decided that two different cartridges were not necessary and only one cartridge should remain. As early as 1899, the Marine Corps awarded the first contract for the Army's M1892 Krag, only to send the brand new rifles to the warehouse a few years later, for the Army was already on the lookout for new weapons at this time. The turning point in the service of the Norwegian rifle was the Spanish-American War, during which the American Army experienced the effects of the Spanish Mausers. Thus, on July 1, 1898, at El Caney, 500 Spanish soldiers with Mausers for 12 hours, until they ran out of ammunition, held off an attack of almost 7,000 Americans. In the end, the Americans took the heights and captured Santiago, but the residue remained. Having 16 times more people, the Americans managed to lose three times more. The commission that investigated the successes of the American father commanders decided that the M1892 rifle was to blame. The Spanish 7S57 cartridge is more powerful than the Krag, 30, 40, and the Mauser is also more rapid-firing because it has clip-feeding, while the Krag does not. How objective were the conclusions of this commission, I cannot judge. However, I can say for sure that a little later, similar cries started to be heard from South Africa. Give the Mauser to the soldiers. The M1893 Mausers captured in Cuba quickly ended up in the Springfield Armory with the admonition, get our boys to fight with guns as good as this. At first, gunsmiths tried to modernize the M1892. The problem of clip loading was quite solvable. It was provided by the design and it was enough to produce a clip. But there was a hitch with the high-powered ammunition. In October 1899, the Americans tried to adopt a reinforced ammunition, but it was too powerful for the bolt, which was locked on one firing pin. It was clear they had to change everything, and they had to reload the 3.5 million rounds of reinforced ammunition that had already been produced. It started, as usual, with an ammunition, the creators of which were guided by the idea of as powerful as possible. That's how the point three zero zero three seven six sixty two s 3 came into being. In 1906, the Americans, following the advanced European powers, adopted the pointed bullet and the .3006 cartridge, respectively. The designers got it right. The .3006 was arguably the most powerful mass-produced rifle ammunition in both world wars. The thrifty generals even managed to adopt multi-barreled Gatlings for this cartridge, but then reason prevailed, and the Gatlings were sent to the warehouse in 1911. Creation of the new rifle followed the simplest way. Let's copy Mauser and nobody will notice anything. 
The rifle was based on a trophy rifle, and the stock and sights were borrowed from M1892. The barrel was shortened to 610 mm so that the weapon could be used both as an infantry rifle and as a cavalry carbine. This is how the rifle model, 1903 caliber .303, was created. The muzzle velocity of the bullet was 720 m per s compared to 680 m per s of the .30, 40 crag with the .30, 06-pointed bullet. The velocity increased to 850 m per s. The U.S. Army got a good, serviceable rifle and a lawsuit from Mauser for manufacturing the design without a license. The government lost the lawsuit and paid the Germans two five zero 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 dollars However, the gun drama did not end there. On the fields of World War I, about 75% of the American Expeditionary Corps were armed not with Springfield's M1903, but with another rifle, the M1917. In April 1917, when the U.S. entered World War I, there were about 600,000 M1903S in the armed forces. This was a bit small against the background of plans to deploy an army of several million. Thanks to generous funding and dancing with tambourines by the end of 1917, the state arsenals have riveted another 100,000 rifles. So what happened was something that American officers hated. They had to bow to the bigwigs in the arms business. And here we have to go back a little bit to the cries of give us a Mauser during the Anglo-Boer War. Having generalized the experience of the war, the British created the Mauser-shaped P-13 rifle under a very powerful 7x60 cartridge so that no one would complain about the superiority of enemy rifles. Due to the outbreak of World War I, work on the new cartridge was curtailed and the rifle was converted to .303 British. The military liked the resulting P-14 rifle. It was more accurate and more technologically advanced than the standard SML rifle. Instead, the British government contracted the Americans from Winchester, Remington, and Eddystone to produce the P-14. So, when the U.S. Army approached private companies to produce M-1903 rifles, the Army received a counteroffer. The companies have already established production of rifles for British orders, and it is faster and easier to remake P-14 for American .30-06 than to remake the whole production for M-1903. This is how the M1917 rifle came into service with the U.S. Army. Privateers, loaded with government money, produced more than two million rifles. The first interesting feature of the rifle was its six-round magazine. Simply, a magazine designed for five British cartridges could hold six American ones. That's even better, said the generals. However, the magazine was the same as the M1903, five-round magazine. The second feature was the diopter sight, which was so popular with Americans that it was later adopted by M1903A3 and M1 Garand. After the war, commanders decided that the American-style Mauser was better than the British-style Mauser. The M1903 became the single rifle of the U.S. Armed Forces, while the M1917 went into storage to be later dispersed to various parts of the world from Greenland to the Philippines.